Google wants you to put another screen inside your house. Elon Musk has a very big rocket that could take you to Mars or to LA. We all played Cuphead and we'll tell you what we think. All that and so much more coming up on Tech News Today. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Tech News Today is provided by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This is Tech News Today, episode 1864, recorded Friday, September 29th, 2017. This episode of Tech News Today is brought to you by Rocket Mortgage by Quicken Loans. Home plays a big role in your life. That's why Quicken Loans created Rocket Mortgage. It lets you apply simply and understand the entire mortgage process fully so you can be confident that you're getting the right mortgage for you. Get started at rocketmortgage.com slash TNT. Welcome to Tech News Today. This is the show where we tell you the tech news and we tell it to you with a smile. We try. <laughs> We're going to tell you about this tech news. I'm Jason Howell. I'm Megan Maroney. Should we get to telling? Yeah, let's get to some telling. All right, let's do this. Security firm Duo showed its research at the EcoParty Security Conference that demonstrates how the firmware on a large number of Macs isn't getting, haven't been getting any updates, either due to a lack of updates being offered by Apple or due to a silent failing uh, updating procedure happening in, in the background. Apple's EFI, which stands for Extensible Firmware Interface, runs prior to the operating system boot up process. And when it's outdated, that leaves the entire system vulnerable to years old EFI attacks that have the ability to gain deeper control over the target machine than if it was just a, you know, something further up the chain running on the OS or something along those lines. Firmware goes much deeper. It isn't something the updates to this is is not the type of thing that a user has to choose to do. It should happen on its own. So we're always, you know, urging people to keep their systems updated, you know, update to the latest. Uh, you know, if, if uh, the operating system has an update waiting for you, don't wait. Push that through now to be as safe as possible. The problem is these updates aren't necessarily user controllable. They happen in the background. And uh, if they're not happening, that just leaves wide open holes uh, potentially for a lot of bad stuff to happen on the machine. Yeah. And the worst part about this is that they don't know. They think, you yeah. know, it says your system is up to date. It's super dangerous for uh, organizations, enterprise, small businesses, big businesses, um, especially users with high security clearance or access to sensitive information. This is really dangerous. I mean, with the Equifax hack, we were talking about how oh, if they'd only gotten their their updates, like they knew that they weren't, you know, they, they knew that they weren't updated. The mm -hmm. Windows was telling them. Mac is not saying that they're not updated. This is, uh, this is... A, a big problem. It's it to be fair. The study says that it is also a problem for Windows. Mm -hmm. uh, that this just was a study they did on Macs only. They're not saying like that Macs aren't also uh, don't have similar problems with EFI firmware. Um, Windows computers are even more likely to be at risk, and more, it's yeah. riskier because there are more of them in the enterprise. Right. Yeah, and all sorts of different uh, different ways that they go about kind of locking this this part of it of the firmware down uh the study itself they didn't actually go in and analyze all those things but yeah they were kind of positing it's probably a whole lot worse over there in the case of this particular study 73,000 apple machines were analyzed of those 4.2 percent of the Macs that were tested had the wrong efi version paired with the operating system version. Uh, so in other words, the software update happened, but it failed to actually update the EFI as it should have. Uh, just some examples, 2015, 21.5-inch uh, iMac models had failed EFI, EFI updates on 43% of the machines that they tested. Uh, 25 to 30% of the 2016 MacBook Pros had failed EFIs. And uh, basically, there's you know there there is malware that can check to see if an EFI is outdated, and if so, you know they they can gain full full control, and you would never know. Mm -hmm. So it's not a not good at all. Dual Labs does say, and if you uh, they have a GitHub page, they say that they're near release of a tool that can check your EFI uh, to see kind of what the status is on your EFI. It's called EFI G or Effigy. Uh, and there's a kind of a parking place on, on GitHub for that. So they say it's coming soon uh, to check back for that so that you can check the status of your EFI. 
Sources tell TechCrunch that Google is working on a home assistant with a touch screen, like the Amazon Show, which would explain why they cut off Amazon's access to YouTube this week through the Echo Show. It's codenamed Manhattan, and the rumored device will have a seven-inch screen that will let that will let you watch YouTube, let you view, view your Google Photos, interact with Google Assistant, and make video calls. It will also function as your home smart hub. Uh, Facebook is also reportedly working on something similar, a smart screen for video calling called Aloha. This Google uh, device, according to TechCrunch, could launch this year. I, I'm thinking like Google Keep. I, mean, I love so many Google apps. So I, I think a screen, uh, a little Google screen like that would be great. Right now I connect my Google Calendar to my Echo Show. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I say what's on my calendar and it shows me a list of all the things, all the activities that my kids are going to, all the meetings that I have at work. I love it. It's like the closest that I've gotten to this elusive, you know, uh, screen in the kitchen that we've mm -hmm. always talk, uh, talked about, that it would just be great. Better than a calendar, better than a whiteboard, just something, a touch screen that would show everything that everyone's doing. And if they cut that off, if you cut that <laughs> off, Google, I will come find you. <laughs> don't do it. You don't want to make Megan upset. Um, yeah, but I mean, you know, I've heard you also talk about like yet another screen in the home I guess it's probably Marco, though, that's a little bit yeah, more no, hesitant. Yeah, I'm fine. Having... Screens everywhere. <laughs> no, I know. Because I know I'm a little hesitant for that very yeah. reason. Because I know my kids well enough to know that, like, you know, like I've talked about the music phone that they have. That's all it does is it plays music and, you know, streams from Google Play Music. If that did anything else, they'd be on it all the time. But because I know it's locked down to music, I'm fine with them having it all the time and making sure that their screen time for other things is very limited and follows the schedule. This is just one of those devices that would totally throw that out the window i'd spend all of my time you know trying to uh batten down the hatches on it you know than actually enjoying what it could offer well hopefully that people working on it would maybe also have the same problems yeah, similar maybe problems so. i mean yeah. maybe there would be some some sort of family you know lock. yeah family lock where you couldn't did you ever figure out how to turn off youtube like only get the music from YouTube and not the videos so that your kids weren't? Uh, yes, I actually was able to do that on the devices that I set up with Google's Family Link, uh -huh. which um, when you do Family Link, you're, you're setting the device, like you have to wipe out the device and start fresh and log into their account that's set up through Family Link. So it's a parental control kind of system that's baked into the OS a little bit deeper than some of the third-party solutions. But when you do that, you can determine whether you want YouTube to even exist on the device at all. And uh, that was kind of the thing that was missing. So like on that music phone, for example, it's in Family Link. I've removed YouTube functionality. So even if there is a music video that links into Google Play Music, uh, it doesn't show. And so all they get is music. So that was kind of a lifesaver there. Is that music phone a radio? What do you mean? <laughs> just kidding. I just as it's like a music phone. You don't use it as a phone. It's a music player. All it is is a music player. But it's yeah. funny that you're calling it a phone. A yeah. Oh yeah. Phone. Well, you know, I'm used to that because that's what they call it. <laughs> right. Where's the music phone? And your kids will never make phone calls. They'll just by the time they they'll be like, I don't even know what you mean. Talk to someone with my voice. That doesn't even make sense. <laughs> that's true. That's probably very true. I will be curious on this particular device. I mean, I guess it would be running Android, right? Like that's kind of Google's operating system for all sorts of devices. Mm -hmm. I'd be curious to see how Android, how they would treat Android on a device like this because I don't envision a device like this with like an Android home screen on it. You know what I mean? Like that just doesn't seem, seems a little hacky. I would want something that was de designed around the interface to be elegant and everything. But I imagine underneath it probably would be running Android. Well, you know, I had that front row camera. It was a live streaming yeah. camera that you could wear around your neck and it ran Android and it had a beautiful interface. It was, it looked a little bit like a smartwatch. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you just slid over and the um, icons you could choose, you know, and it's a very limited amount of icons, right. take a picture. Uh, there was a watch on there and a, a compass. And um, so I can imagine something like that. Whatever it is, I it's probably so. going to be uh, customizable as Android phones are and, mm -hmm. and pretty. Yeah, well, and if it's running Android, then technically it could run all sorts of Android apps and be a little bit more expandable in that regard because of that app compatibility. So uh, that could be a good thing as well, kind of extending the functionality of it even further. Tesla CEO Elon Musk announced that it has signed a contract to bring the world's largest lithium-ion battery to South Australia with a 100-day deadline, lest the battery be completely free 
uh, if they don't meet that deadline. The area is prone to blackouts and gas shortages, and Musk believes he can wrap this up with a nice little bow quickly, which would be great exposure for this type of energy storage for other parts of the world that, fee that face similar restrictions, similar issues. Uh, it would provide power for more than 30,000 homes. That's the same number of homes that lost power during major blackouts that happened in the area last year. And then in March, you may remember earlier this year, Musk said on Twitter that he could install 100 megawatt storage facility in the area in 100 days or it would be entirely free. Now he's kind of following through on that. And that cost, by the way, if it's free, that would be a cost to Tesla of roughly around $50 million or so. He said that on Twitter a little bit later after that. Yeah, this uh, they're racing to beat the summer, the Australian summer, yep. which starts in December. So um, they really want to get that up and running. I, th I think he can do it. Yeah, I think he can too. This and Mars, which we'll talk about next. Um, but yes, getting getting to it in time for the summer, which is when all of that stuff happens, uh, you know, the the potential faults can happen. Uh, he says 50 megawatts are already on this on site and in place. So I think it's very likely to happen if, if kind of half the job is already taken care of and they've only just now started uh, the 100 day countdown uh, deadline but that's just because they've signed the contract so now he's basically put his money on the line and said and i guess uh tesla beat out 90 total bids uh for this energy storage so him saying that was obviously a part to, a part of his way tesla's way of backing that up and saying hey we want to be the one to show the rest of the world uh how you can how you can better plan for this and you know use their batteries in the process and uh, do some really cool things. I guess in the island of Kauai, they're also uh, playing around with this. 272 Tesla battery packs there that store energy for use at nighttime. And I guess it's cut down a lot of uh, the cost that was associated with that prior. We should probably go to Kauai to, to, to make, test it. Yeah, to do some real journalism. All right, let's take mm -hmm. the whole company. Everyone, everyone to Kauai. For this very okay. important story. Awesome. <laughs> also at the International Astronautical Congress this week, Musk announced his grand plans to get to Mars in giant reusable spaceships in the next five years. In the same announcement, he detailed city-to-city -city rocket travel on Earth. The rockets, called BFR, will hold a bigger payload than any other rocket before it. Musk insists they'll be capable of hoisting spaceships shape spaceships into the air to transport you from LA to New York in 29 minutes or anywhere in the world in under an hour for the same price as an economy ticket on an airplane. Uh, BFR, just so you know, does not stand for big friendly rocket. That's not what it stands for. <laughs> big Friendly rocket. I'll let you uh, guess what it stands for. Uh, also included in his master plan uh, was a moon base. And he showed off some uh, prototypes of what that might look like. Uh, he, he says these are aspirational claims. Um, so, but he's, he's done... He has done as many amazing things as he's made as many amazing things happen as things that he's said he would do. Like I think in equal parts, like the reusable yeah. rockets, the SpaceX reusable rockets are amazing. No one can doubt that. And you know, he's said a lot of other crazy stuff. Um, so you never know what he's going to do. Um, engineers uh, have been pressure testing them in the ocean. So uh, I don't know. Would you want to fly in one of these pressure tested BFRs? Yeah, I'd be in a big rocket. Uh, sure. That sounds like a lot of fun. I, I would absolutely do that. If we were going to Mars, let's say, let's just you know take a trip to Mars. Uh, the BFR lifts the spaceship. It has 40 cabins inside, two to three people per cabin, 100 people total per flight. Uh, that BFR, of course, you know, big part of this is lowering the cost and that requires that that's why, um, they focus so heavily on returning that that rocket to the launch pad, reusable rockets in that regard. Uh, the spaceship uh, continues to orbit to refill the tanks, methane, oxygen propellant, and then it shoots off to Mars for a months long journey with uh, all those people occupying the spaceship. Um, and they're saying that they can get this happening without passengers as early as 2022. And then a few years later, send four BFRs to, to Mars with two carrying cargo, two carrying people. So 2024, that's seven years away. Mm. Um, in, in a mere seven years, 
we might be witnessing people shooting off to Mars. Well, uh, Beatmaster in our chat room wants you to go. He says, get your mask to Mars, <laughs> Jason. <laughs> Thank you very much. I appreciate the, uh, <laughs> the Arnold reference. Um, as for Earth travel, New York to Shanghai in 39 minutes. Basically, he said, Musk said, any two points on Earth would be less than one hour apart. That is awesome. That is so cool. If your brains didn't turn to jelly, it is definitely awesome. Let's hope that your brains don't turn to jelly. That would be a horrible side effect. Mm -hmm. But I have faith. I as, have faith. As side effects go, it would not be a good one. <laughs> not very high on that list. After the break, Sam Moscovich is here to tell us why everyone is fascinated by a new character who has a cup for a head. But first, let's take a minute to thank Rocket Mortgage, the sponsor of this episode. If you have bought a house any time in the recent past, and if you've needed a mortgage uh, it, because you didn't have all that money sitting around in your mattress, then you know that the mortgage process was not keeping up with the times. And if you are keeping a bunch of money in your mattress, you are also not keeping up with the times. But I'm not gonna judge you. I just wanna tell you uh, that the current mortgage process was dated. It needed a client-focused technological revolution. And that, my friends, is why Quicken Loans created a Rocket Mortgage. Rocket Mortgage gives you the confidence you need when it comes to buying a home or refinancing your existing home loan. It's simple allowing you to fully understand all the details and be confident you're getting the right mortgage for you. It's convenient. Their trusted partners allow you to share your financial information with Rocket Mortgage at the touch of a button. It's powerful. So whether you're looking to buy your first home or your 10th home, Rocket Mortgage is able to perform thousands of calculations in just seconds. Your mattress won't do that for you. Based on your income, assets, and credit, Rocket Mortgage can analyze all of the home loan options for which you qualify for and find the one that is just right for you. Rocket Mortgage by Quicken Loans. Apply simply, understand fully, mortgage confidently. To get started, go to rocketmortgage.com slash TNT. That's rocketmortgage.com slash TNT. Equal housing lender, licensed in all 50 states, nmlsconsumeraccess.org, number 3030. And we thank Rocket Mortgage by Quicken Loans for their support. Everybody, I mean, I mean everybody. Everyone. Has been, everybody's been talking about the new game Cuphead, inspired by 1930s cartoon art. As per usual, we reserve judgment on all video games until we talk to Sam Moscovich from Ars Technica. Welcome, Sam. Don't don't let them say anything <laughs> bad about you. You're what? as beautiful as what did, as, as sorry. Okay, that's what, your what did you do to that thing? <laughs> that's I'm loving it. Anyone who's listening as opposed to watching just missed me cuddling with my new Super Nintendo Classic, <laughs> which we will talk about in a bit, I'm sure. But there's another equally gorgeous thing. Indeed, Cuphead is out. Finally, it's been teased and talked about for years, but this platforming cartoony game exists and it is gorgeous. Uh, anyone watching the video version of this will be uh, lucky to see video footage of the game running, but they're not going to hear the audio with it. And this is truly a 1930s cartoon in terms of sound and motion combining to incredible effect. Uh, now, as a video game, it plays essentially like a, a platformer with gunning. So I like to think of Mega Man as sort of the perfect example of where you have to run around and there's tough stuff happening and you have to shoot a little gun in order to win against incredibly tough enemies and really tricky platforming. Uh, it's all being done in this game uh, in a style of, I'd say a very early um, Looney Tunes or Merry Melodies kind yeah. of styled uh, cartoon. Uh, Bosco is one of the uh, cartoon series that I think of a lot with this, although this is color. Um, just gorgeous. Every single moment you play it looks wonderful, which is good because it is also really hard. This game could only take you about an hour and 30 minutes to beat if you are the greatest video game player ever. However, this is tough as nails, perfect, precise kind of gameplay stuff. Um, and as a result, you're going to replay each level if you want to truly beat the game on normal difficulty. You're going to play each level up to 80 times in order to beat it. 80, 8 zero. That is the amount of, of tries that both myself and Ars Technica's Kyle Orland went through to beat some of the game's bosses. The game is now, unlike some other um, Mega Man and Super Mario styled games, its focus is mostly on bosses. And I think they do this because beautiful hand-drawn bosses look way cooler for the style of game that Cuphead does. 
than, say, just an average run around and jump on tiny little creatures. Uh, the bosses have lots of little tiny henchmen and things that come flying at you in every direction. It looks really cool. But you have to essentially learn these patterns uh, in, a, in a way that feels, I mean, the whole thing feels like an 80s Nintendo instruction booklet. When you look at these old instruction booklets and hope that a game would ever look like these little hand-drawn little details that were put in, well, that's what happens here, but the game is as hard as an 80s Nintendo game, the kind where you would essentially get one game for 60 bucks and play it for the whole rest of the school year. I uh, It took me about an hour and a half to play through just the, um, the the beginning where it teaches you how to play it. I tried it. Alex <laughs> downloaded it on his <laughs> Windows machine. And uh, the tutorial is what I believe you people you call these what? things. You know what? It's funny. And that is the thing. As I tested this out with other friends, and I found that was the same issue. Because there are people who are looking at this and going, this is beautiful. And the game has a quote-unquote simple mode that you can trigger in order to have simpler bosses and simpler challenges. But the tutorial even introduces stuff that is annoying and obnoxious. There's a parry system is what they yeah. call it, where you have to double tap the jump button at the perfect moment in midair when a little tiny pink thing comes at you. Uh, there's the dash maneuver you have to use to sort of bounce around. It's just there's a few too many buttons, I feel like, to make this as accessible as I think we all kind of hoped this would be. This is not the ultimate beautiful cartoon game that anyone can jump into just because they think it looks good. No, this is a game that looks really good because you're going to be looking at it a lot if you actually invest in it. It's hard. You're going to be listening to the songs and playing through the levels over and over and over. And so the beauty and the presentation are there to help you uh, suffer. I, I played this for a little while as well, and I had a, a great time playing through it. Um, and I, I love the art style. I'm very curious to know, because like I'm, I'm kind of reading up a little bit on how this was put together. And uh, the art director, Chad Moldenhauer, just basically said, you know, th this didn't get digital for a very, like this didn't enter the digital realm for a very long time. It's all hand drawn, which I imagine takes forever when you're, when you're creating an entire game's worth of art and it's all hand drawn to begin with. Have you seen any other games that kind of follow this path? It seems so obvious now that this would have happened already. And I can almost see like a He-Man era, you know, that bad animation from the eighties, a uh, games falling into this category. Do you think this is like the birth of a new category of, of games uh, in terms of art style? If it makes money, yeah, but that's really hard to do yeah. hand-drawn everything because, again, they aren't doing sort of the cheating that you might expect from right. something like He-Man. He-Man went to pretty cheap route and also used, you know, terrible overseas labor. Don't ever read up on that if you ever want to feel good about yourself. Um, it, it, there's a lot of work that goes into making a video game look like an instruction manual in your mind from the 80s. So if this one indeed makes money, sure. I think we've seen um, in the retro phase of gaming kind of the opposite, where people have said, no, nah, we're going to go with pixelation and sort of simpler stuff to get games done more quickly. This one took three or four years and is it's only 20 bucks. I yeah. mean, I almost think that they should just charge you to watch it on YouTube. Like you should just be able to pay five bucks and watch someone else play it just to enjoy it as, as a short film. Because again, not only is there beautiful stuff and music tied in, there's also uh, a lot of cute story and elements like that where the, there's lots of little jokes that are scattered around the entire time. Every time you die in a boss, you get a different one-liner making fun of how you lost because there's so many different ways in which you can lose in these boss battles that they keep track of it. They've really built the whole thing for you to get into it and be immersed. If I was eight years old, 12 or even 15 years old, this would be my game of the year, hands down. As a grown up, I don't have as much patience for this, but I will say it's fair in its brutal difficulty. If that sounds anywhere near interesting to you, grab it. Otherwise, head to YouTube. Hmm. I really like the music as well. Um, I, I think, and you can buy the soundtrack. Oh, that's what yeah, I was going to say. You, I would like, you I, can buy it for 10 bucks. Oh. Uh, I can't remember. I, I don't have a link handy, but I do imagine if you just type cuphead one word and then soundtrack, it should be the first thing that pops up. Oh, so excellent. definitely if you like that thirties, big band jazz style, uh, it's really, really great soundtrack. Yeah, I'm just warning you, uh, it's not like watching cartoons in the thirties, like we all did in the 1930s. Um, it's a little harder than that. Yes, yes. Also, there's um, some... Just kidding. I wasn't alive in the 1930s, Sam. You might have had, you know, <laughs> someone who talked to you about it okay. in the good old days. Um, yes. <laughs> okay, so let's let's get to your rant, uh, your, your weekly rant. You wanted to talk about loot boxes. What are loot boxes? Why do you think they've reached a new low? 
I, I love that you say my weekly rant like I've got the sweet soapbox, although it's true. Uh, also, we're not talking about, you know, a lute like that, a little instrument. We're talking L-O-O-T, loot boxes. Oh, I wish it was become, a loot box. Uh, yeah, that'd be great. And in fact, if someone makes loot box or loot crate with the musical thing and maybe like it comes with a little plastic recorder, I would buy it. No questions. But loot boxes or loot crates in video games have become a lot more prominent in recent years. They've been around for some time. Some people tie them to MMO games from the late aughts and early teens. Other people mention Team Fortress 2. But the idea is that we're combining real money, virtual items, and random chance. So you go into a game and it says, oh, here's a free random item. And you tap it and a little flashy animation plays and out pops a new costume for your favorite character or a graffiti spray that you can tag on the wall of an arena that you're fighting in and so on and so forth. And then it says, oh, if you want more of this kind of stuff, you can either play a lot of the game to earn them slowly or you can pay us cash to get these virtual items a lot more quickly. Now, paying for virtual items has been around a lot, but it's this extra randomization that really adds this slot machine sort of crap to a video game and to the feeling of a video game. Now, uh, Forza Motorsport 7 just is, has just come out in a quote-unquote deluxe version, meaning you can pay more now to play it immediately, or you can wait another like four days to pay less money for the normal version. That's another thing that annoys me, where they're charging you more to play early. But yes. in addition to this $60 or more retail price, you can also now get into a driving game's loot boxes. Uh, these are called prize crates inside of Forza Motorsport 7. Here's the problem. Um, and apologize for some of the wonk as I explain this. The way that these crates work is that most of them give you things that are really stupid. Now, some of them are costumes, but these costumes are for your race car driver. And I don't know if you've ever been in one of these sim cars in a video game or real life, but they have very tinted windows. You're looking at the really sexy car, so you're not looking at the person inside of it dressed like a clown or a cheerleader. So it's sort of a weird thing that they're attaching a random giveaway to that you could maybe have your little race car driver look like a clown if, you know, you get the right little random loot box, et cetera. That's one annoying thing. But the more annoying thing is that every single one of these um, prize crates randomly comes with what they call mods. And the short version of this is that these mods exist to make you more virtual coins. You can spend virtual coins to get the mods, which then get you more virtual coins, which you then spend on more mods to spend on virtual coins and on and on and on. I was at dinner the other night and I liken this to going to a restaurant, eating and then going to the bathroom and then eating that and then going to the bathroom and then eating that and then going to the bathroom. Not appetizing at all whatsoever. It's essentially turning your car game into a bean counting game. And I go into much greater detail about this at Ars Technica. But the short of it is that this to me is the exact endpoint, I think, of random crap that you buy for a video game. Uh, virtual items that don't exist, that you're actually just buying away to buy more stuff. You are paying to earn. It is garbage. And if any of that made sense, or even if it didn't, I hope that you take away the sense that video game companies now think it's a good idea to not only charge you to just get into a video game, you know, your 60, 70, 80 dollars, but then they want to tease you with this slot machine sort of mechanic, whether or not you actually pay money in order to make it go faster, it is still messing with your brain. And it's still coming in products that are rated for less than um, mature. I mean, this is an E E10 I think that's 10 and up age for this game, uh, for Forza. And the, the research is incredibly clear that when you put and normalize gambling systems for children, it affects them with compulsive gambling behaviors and other bad habits. I think it sucks. I think it's irresponsible. And I think video game publishers need to hear not only from random people on the internet, but from purveyors, people who like play them for a living and think that they have important thoughts, maybe me, maybe other people, but I really think anyone who has any power to talk to a video game company and say, no, enough is enough, should take this example of paying to earn and saying, stop it. Let us buy a video game and let that be done with it. Or if you want to do these random virtual item purchases, do that as the only way to pay. Make that be the concession of going, all right, it's kind of free, but here's the catch. Fine. Let me pay with my wallet. Choose with my wallet. Don't give me this bait and switch. Ugh. 
I, I hear your frustration. I mean, and, and what sucks. <laughs> that sounds like my therapist. <laughs> I, now, uh, tell me how you're feeling. Um, yeah, yeah. What really sucks about this sort of thing is like, I feel this way also with a lot of in-app in in game purchases on mobile, right? Is that they kind of they they know they understand the science behind, you know, the the desire to to participate in these sorts of of gambling like contests, and so they keep doing it. And I mean, they're going to keep doing it because they they make a lot of money, and that's the unfortunate thing. Is like even if, I mean, and it's not it's not like it's not important to complain and everything, but people are still going to buy it because it's so hard not to for a lot of people, you know, to to resist that temptation to buy into it. It's just a shame that we're here because I remember when games did not have these kinds of mechanics that just, it, it feels so manipulative. Well, we, we remember the era in which games were hard in order to get your money. You know, Pac-Man and Donkey Kong were hard because that's how you spent more money. Yes, that was a given. You know, paying 25 cents a pop, Get it. That's how it was built. And mobile games that start out totally free and prey on this sort of thing and charge you accordingly. Okay, you started for free. You jumped in. You bought in. Uh, but I think it, this is beginning to poison games that should be fun for fun. Yeah. I, there, yeah. I mentioned in my article some gun games where you run around and compete and shoot at other dudes online. And they want to bait you with these loot boxes that randomly pop up with flashy slot machine-like animations and want to hook you in. And that becomes the reason to play. This is why the game matters, is effectively what they're saying. That when you finish a match, it's telling you how close you are to that next loot box. Ooh, it might take you a while to get that next flashy animation. Pay up to get there faster. And I just say no. Let me... Give me a game that's fun and let me pay for a game that's fun and let that be the end of it. Um, and I just I just think it's poisoning reputations and it's poisoning our feeling about games and it's going to wear people out. And, and that's what's going to you're going to lose actual fans and gamers. They want these monthly recurring players to show up and hang out and play games. Maybe making a game fun will get them to come back as opposed to this addictive crap, because eventually the addictive preying on our psychology kind of stuff does run out of steam and then people will find other hobbies to spend their stuff on. Yeah, Right, because if you're paying to play a game, you're not playing the game, right? And it's, so it's like what you're saying is the game is not fun enough on its own. Now, conversely, you could just go to the store if you can find one and just get one of these Super Nintendo Classic Editions, which doesn't have any internet connectivity and just gives you 21 games for $80. That's such a value. And it comes in this tiny little thing. I mean, look at the controller for the Super Nintendo Classic. I know I'm just changing the topic here, but this controller is the same size as the system. <laughs> and it's hard to like see it in a photo, but I finally, when I got it, I'm like, this, this controller to system ratio is insane. Um, I don't know if you guys have any any thoughts on this if you've already gotten to check one out yourselves but i finally i went and picked one up because i'm not as cool as ours technic as kyle orland i didn't get one early but i haven't even plugged it in yet i just got back from best buy where i uh, pre-ordered mine somehow uh and it's a really solid construction and it plugs in real easy although it's really funny it actually has the same chipset as the nes classic pretty much identical someone took the super nintendo one apart and all they've done is just change out the little shell around it so if you get one of these you essentially kind of get the same thing just with different games in the chip but you know hey this is not bad you know it, it may not there may not be enough of these to go around they may be selling out left and right but you know, hopefully they're actually making good on their promise of making enough of these so you don't have to go to an eBay scalper and hang out with your precious Super Nintendo Classic Edition. Comes with two controllers, by the way. I swear, I'm not a shill for Nintendo. I just think it's a nice segue to have something that doesn't connect to the internet and just says, here's games, here's fun, go do it. And did you have to wait in line for it? Uh, no, I pre-ordered a, a while back. I, I got in for like a perfect 12-minute window in which I could get onto Best Buy and pre-order one. I only pre-ordered one. I'm not scalping. That's not my, I'm not going to pay for my kid's college tuition that way. It's tempting though. <laughs> Different system entirely. You'll pay for that tuition with, um, have you haven't even had a chance to play around with Star Fox too, right? Like that's, that's no, the main thing I, that I'm really curious about. That is, uh, and we've, uh, Kyle Orland at Ars Technica, his review of that will go up at some point. Uh, and based on, I played the old beta that kind of, it was a mm -hmm. prototype ROM that came out back in the day, and it's not that much different than this one. This is a curious game. Consider it more of an, an historical artifact as opposed to a truly great game. Because all of the good ideas from Star Fox 2 were essentially put into later games like Star Fox 64 right. and Star Fox Command. Uh, Star Fox 2 was absolutely an experiment. 
in trying, okay, let's make it fully 3D as opposed to the original game, which, which it was much more on rails. It guided you toward the action. And this one is much more, it feels a lot more like a PC game where it sort of throws you out to the wolves and says, you have a bunch of random stuff to take care of. You have to manage a base and keep it alive and kind of play the game over and over and try to get your score up. It's ambitious, it's wonky, and the frame rate is terrible at certain points because it is essentially designed to, they did not soup it up to like work better with modern hardware. It plays just like it would have if it had come out on the Super Nintendo. Right. But if you do have an opportunity to play it in one way or another, you know, whether you have to, you know, go steal a bunch from a truck or something, you know, give it a shot. But I mean, it's not, it, I would not say that you need to go and spend $300 to get a Super NES just to try Star Fox 2. It's definitely more of a curio than a must play. But I mean, goodness, there's so many other good games on it. You just flash Yoshi's Island on the screen and I'm already like, ah, I can't wait to go sit and play that. So, <laughs> uh, We don't recommend that you steal any off of a truck. Just, just to be clear on that. <laughs> Come to my house. Come hang out. <laughs> Sam, thank you so much for joining us. As always, Sam is the culture editor at Ars Technica and at Sam Red on Twitter. Now go play your, your SNES. Okay, hold on. Let's get one more creepy shot of me. Okay. Oh, it's so creepy. <laughs> Does it also work as a razor? <laughs> we'll, we'll find out next week. Okay. All right, all right. All right. All right, thank you, Sam. Have a great Have night. Have a good weekend. <laughs> all right, Brian writes in uh, feedback time in regards to the iPhone radio. Uh, he says, he says, the solution might be to have the phone start a countdown whenever there's an emergency alert. And then if the cell towers go offline, the radio would then activate. Then when the cell towers come back on, the radio would deactivate as cell service is now back online. This is in regards, of course, to the iPhone uh, FM radio capability that uh, Ajit Pai of the FCC seems to think that there is in the iPhone uh, but there is not. Yeah, that was, uh, I was, I spent a lot of time yesterday evening being really annoyed by that, that <laughs> first of all, that we even chose to report it. Uh, it was a waste of time. Like they, it was exactly as you said, they have radios in them. There's no switch you can flip. It's not like Apple like was just not doing it. It doesn't work. Like the, the antenna either. doesn't work. I got, we got lots of email about that. Um, I got email about, uh, in, uh, we're showing on the screen, uh, uh, John Gruber's piece on Daring Fireball about, uh, how, uh, why, how and why uh, it doesn't, they, they can't just flip a switch and everyone would be saved and, and how Apple does do things to try to, to help people. So yeah, that was, that was frustrating. And, yeah. um, and I think I also got an email about how it doesn't run down the battery. There were several people who emailed me saying they use the radio chip in their Android phone and they can use it all day mm. and it doesn't run down the battery versus like streaming music, which would definitely, oh yeah, streaming the, the radio. data, data heavy versus something that's a little mm -hmm. bit lighter. I mean, anytime you do something extra, it's going to run down the battery more than if it wasn't on there, but um, yeah. So, uh, well, there you go. I guess uh, Ajit's just going to have to wait. Right. And TNT's fan of the day is Mostafa on Twitter, who sent us this picture from inside a Tesla Model S saying, this <gasps> is how I watch TNT wow. while supercharging and with a laptop. Lucky. Well. Mm -hmm. You supercharging and all the screens in, in, your, uh, in your Tesla. That's, that's pretty impressive looking, mm -hmm. got to say. Show us how you watch or listen to TNT. Record a video or take a picture of yourself or your setup. Post it on Instagram, Google Plus, Twitter, or Facebook. Use the hashtag how I watch TNT and we're going to find it. Take a break, a, a breath, because that sounded very really difficult, yeah. but you did it. Uh, in a former life, I was a Commodore 64 hacker, which is to say that when I think of my childhood, it's filled with run, stop buttons and peak commands. So when I saw that the C64 was getting its own mini version, you better believe it caught my attention. Now it's still early, but here's what we know. It's called the C64 Mini. Nowhere in any of the advertising uh, for this or any of the site does it ever say the word Commodore. So even though it might be licensed, it's not fully licensed as far as I can tell. 64 games pre-installed, 70 bucks. And as you can see, the form factor is basically the old Commodore 64 with a joystick paired to it. Uh, the 64 is maybe half the size of the standard 64, so it fits you know, slightly larger than the palm of your hands. The bummer is that it doesn't look like the keys on the, on the C64 are actually functional, which just kind of 
boggles my mind because if you if you're gonna put out a, a Redux of the Commodore 64, you need the keys there. Like you could do a lot of this in emulation, and I have before, but it's just not the same because the layout of the keyboard, the combination of keys. There's some keys that exist on the, the Commodore 64 keyboard that don't exist on your standard like PC USB keyboard, which by the way you can plug into here to program in Basic and all that kind of stuff. What are, what are the keys that are missing? Well, it has a run stop uh, button oh. that's useful for certain things. The function keys on the side, uh, control, it, it, they're just routed differently also. Like the symbols that are above the numbers are different on the Commodore 64 than they are on a standard keyboard that we use today. So when you want to do something like load a game, the command is is load star comma eight comma one and when you need to do the star it would normally be shift two but instead you have to find you know on on a, a keyboard that we all use it's shift eight but that doesn't tie up and so when you do emulation it ends up kind of throwing things off a little bit and takes a little while for your brain to kind of remember how it how it used to be versus how it is now okay i have a serious Nerdy question. stuff i have a serious <laughs> you know that all of these retro devices won't actually bring your childhood back you still have your mortgage yeah you still um have your dog that might be pooping in places you don't want him to poop <laughs> That's then true. you have to clean it up uh you <laughs> still uh have to show up at work every day so um, yeah. you know that right it doesn't you don't actually get transported back to I know, but c64 it's, days but it's fun to go back mm -hmm. i mean it's fun to relive parts of your childhood and I have I have a very big, obviously, a very big like, affinity for the Commodore 64. Um, I have no faith that this is actually going to be very good. But they do have, if you if you like dive into the the stuff that they have listed on the site, they do say this is the first in a range of C64 reboots, as they call it. They say a fully a full-sized, fully working version is coming in 2018 as well. And I would say that's the one to get. If you can get like a redo of the Commodore 64 that's like made for modern TVs has the HDMI out. I can load the Commodore 64 game images that I have onto it. It's a lot to ask, but if I could do that, I would probably pick one up. I'm not sure that this one's worth it. The games list just isn't that good, but I, I appreciate their effort and who knows, maybe I would get it because it would make it a really good giant keychain. Or something. Oh, good know. idea. TNT records live every Monday through Friday, 4 p.m. Pacific, 7 p.m. Eastern, 2300 UTC at twit.tv slash live. Be part of the show by emailing us, TNT at twit.tv. Leave us a short voicemail, 260 TNT show, and find us on Twitter at Tech News Today TV. And subscribe to our show. Go to twit.tv slash TNT. Subscribe to all of our shows. Go to twit.tv. Find the shows that you love and subscribe to them. And if you want to tweet at me, whatever you want, I'm here for you at Megan Maroney. I'm here for you too. CC me, please. I'm at Jason Howell. Uh, thanks to Kevin, our TD and editor. Uh, thanks to Mario for helping out in the studio. Thanks to everybody who's watching us right now. And thanks to you for talking tech. We'll see y'all next week. Bye, everyone.